Alrighty, good evening everyone. Hopefully as you logged in here you could hear Steve and Steve chatting and get your audio set up. I am Steve Carlson. I'm a staff member here at Practical Farmers of Iowa. I'm in our office in Ames and I'll be sort of the, the host tonight. And so tonight's farm and our topic, thanks for joining us, is about getting more from your cover crops. And we've got two Southwest Iowa farmers here to talk about a couple of innovative ways that they experiment with cover crops on their farms. So first off, we're going to have John Bakehouse of Maple Edge Farm. And then after John, we'll hear from Steve McGrew of McGrew Brothers Farm. Both these guys are down in Mills County. But before I pass it off to these guys, uh, I'm going to go over some information about Practical Farmers of Iowa. So this is the remaining uh, winter farm in our series for this year. We have three more Tuesday nights. These are all Tuesday at 7 o'clock, except you can see on March 10th and March 17th. That is going to be, um, those are two Friday afternoon um, presentations. Otherwise, these are always on Tuesday nights, 7 o'clock. And we do um, record all of these. So if you happen to miss one, we'll have them archived usually at the same week that we have it live. So you can check the Farm in Our Archives on our website to see anything you've missed. We have well over a hundred Farm in Ours that have been archived over the many years we've been doing this. So a lot of topics in there to explore. Uh, next week is diversifying your crop rotation with small grains. And we've got Earl Canfield who's going to be leading that presentation. So maybe that'll interest you and we'll see you next week. So Practical Farmers of Iowa started back in 1985 by a group of farmers who were interested in improving their profitability, efficiency, and stewardship. And today we're still focused on a lot of those same issues. And we're made up of farmers uh, from all enterprises and from farms of all sizes and all across the state and far outside of Iowa as well. Our mission at Practical Farmers of Iowa is strengthening farms and communities through farmer-led investigation and information sharing. Uh, this mission allows us to help farmers practice an agriculture that benefits both the land and the people. And our values at PFI are welcoming everyone, creativity, collaboration, and community, viable farms now and for future generations, and stewardship and ecology. So as a member-based organization, um, we'd like you to join us. There are different membership levels, all with the same benefits. Um, a major benefit of being in Practical Farmers of Iowa is uh, our network of other PFI members. So you can gain access to email discussion lists. Uh, we have one specifically for cover crops. We've got others for livestock, row crops, horticulture, policy. Um, so those are real helpful. Also, you get uh, newsletters, discounts to our events. You get to participate in our programming, like uh, our on-farm research projects. And, um, and if you're a beginning farmer, we have some great beginning farmer programs as well. So I encourage you to look up uh, on our website some more information about membership and, and to join us. Also on our website is an event calendar. And we have a lot of stuff going on this time of year. So check that out, both PFI events and our partner events. Um, we also, next week, uh, next week or so, we should be announcing our spring, uh, our spring field day series on cover crops. So those will be on farms across the state in March and in April, focused on cover crops and grazing cover crops. So look for those to be announced within a week or so. And hopefully you can join us in a spring field day. Then finally, a couple of housekeeping rules here. Like I said in the chat box there, if you want to stay in touch with our farminars, please provide us your email address and I'll get you on our list. We just send out a weekly email during this farminar season to let you know what topics are coming up. Um, also, if you're, uh, if you're inclined, please let us know where you're tuning in from. It's, we are um, Practical Farmers of Iowa, but we have a lot of members and supporters outside of the state. It's fun to see where everyone's tuning in from. I'm in Ames, Iowa. Um, also, if you didn't notice, on the bottom left corner of your screen, there's a little poll. And we'd just like you to check up the appropriate box about how many people are, are listening in tonight from your one computer. It gives us a good uh, head count to figure out just how many people are watching these farminars. So take that poll on the bottom left corner. 
while we're uh, while our presenters are speaking tonight, feel free to use that chat box. It looks like everybody's kind of getting the hang of that. Um, use the chat box to ask clarifying questions while these guys are speaking, uh, but we will reserve time at the end of their presentations for everything uh, that they didn't cover, for other questions that you've got. So be thinking of those as we go along, and we'll try and keep plenty of time for your questions. And then the last thing I want to mention is at the end of our farminar, I'm going to put up a box here with a link to take a survey to provide some feedback, not just about tonight's farminar, but that gives you the opportunity to suggest topics for future presentations. And we take that real seriously. So please, um, near the end of tonight's presentation, uh, look for that link and then take a short survey to give us a little feedback about tonight and, and future topics. So that is all that I've got to say, and I'm going to pull up John Bakehouse's presentation now and, and let John take it over. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Okay, thank you, Steve. Can you hear me? Sure can. Whenever, the, whenever that pops up for you, you can go for it. Okay, very good. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, back in 2013, my wife and I were flying back from Washington, D.C. Uh, it's about mid-March, and I was fortunate, to, fortunate enough to have a window seat, and so I was kind of keeping an eye peeled as we were flying into Epley Airfield in Omaha, Nebraska, uh, hoping that we would fly over our farmstead. You can see we are located in the southwest part of the state here. So as our plane came in from the east flying west, I was kind of keeping a close eye. I saw the orange water tower uh, in Red Oak, Iowa, and followed Highway 34 west. And for miles and miles and acres and acres, what we saw in mid-March were brown cornfields and brown bean fields, even brown yards, brown pastures, brown terraces, you name it. Uh, but as soon as we flew over our farmstead, I saw our uh, cereal rye that we had planted in the fall, uh, a field that we had planted a cereal rye, and it was bright, vibrant green. And I knew then that cover crops, even though maybe we couldn't quantify them on our balance sheet, I knew at that moment that uh, cover crops were the right thing to do. They are the right thing to do in my heart of hearts. So uh, I have been farming the same ground my whole life uh, with my dad, Bach, and uh, uh, we went no-till in the late 90s, and uh, there we go. As you can see, uh, uh, the farm that we farm, the ground that we farm is mostly flat. <laughs> and this is a Google Earth picture that was taken a couple years ago, a couple harvests ago, and as you can see, it's mostly flat and mostly wet. And the last two, three years have been especially wet for us in the fall. Uh, we did go no-till in the late 90s, and at that time I started subscribing to No-Till Farmer magazine. And they started running cover crop articles in earnest, oh, six or seven years ago, maybe eight years ago. So I started really tuning in to some of the things going on with other farmers, especially in Pennsylvania seems to be a hotbed uh, of cover crop activity. So we started with a small small plot of cereal rye. We tried some triticale, and then we went back to rye uh, for the majority of our cover crops. But we've also tried a multi-species mix uh, after a small grain harvest in July. We've tried a multi-species annual grazing mix planted in May. Uh, but regardless of when we plant our cover crops, our main objective is to get something growing as many days out of the year as possible. Corn and soybeans, as we all know, grow actively probably only five to six months out of the year, and something even as simple as cereal rye can add another five to six months uh, to, to that time frame. So as I said before, it's kind of hard to quantify the dollar of value of this in the short term, uh, but we can quantify other benefits such as reduced erosion, grazing, and uh, weed control, which I'll touch a little bit more on later. Uh, but despite our successes that we've had over the years, we have run into some, some limitations as well. Uh, the first is it seems to be the holy grail that everybody's after, and that is seeding a cover crop after soybean harvest. We have tried seeding just a straight cereal, cereal rye cover crop after soybean harvest, uh, but we have seen some antagonistic relationships between our cereal rye cover crop and our cash crop of corn the next spring. So I've been very interested in trying to seed a legume heavy mix after soybean harvest to try to get a more symbiotic uh, relationship going with our following cash crop. So to this end, uh, Stefan and I designed a PFI uh, uh, test plot, uh, kind of investigating the 
um, question, can early maturing corn and soy facilitate fall seeded covers? So today I'm going to talk about our short season plot trial design, our unofficial results so far and our tentative conclusions and what's next. So uh, the research protocols here, it's kind of hard to read. They are available on uh, PFI's website as well. I'll just run through these here. And they're a little bit confusing. So if you have any clarifying questions, certainly ask them as we go along here. So we have two phases for our short season plot design uh, short uh, for corn and soybeans. So we have a short season corn and 104 day uh, relative maturity versus our quote unquote regular season relative maturity, which would be 109. And our beans are a group one five versus a group three. Our fertility program is the boat is the same for both corn and beans. Uh, after, we after we have that planted, we start monitoring our grain mo moisture in August, after which we harvest corn at 23% and soy at 11% and then we plant a cover crop immediately after harvest. Ideally, we like to be chasing that combine with our drill. We do drill all of our cover crops. We've never tried aerial seeding, uh, so I can't speak to the efficacy of aerial seeding, but we do like our um, drill process. And then in the fall, we will collect cover crop biomass samples as well as in the spring. And then the following fall, we'll plant our next plot in the same strips. So we've got long season corn going into our long season bean strips and the short into short. And so with our GPS capabilities, we're hoping to see if planting covers in the same place can improve our soil quality over the years, which is we're probably looking at a five to 10 year, five to 10 year time frame there. So we'll see if we actually uh, last that long. It's been it's been a challenge. As you know, the the fall harvests have really uh, been a challenge with the, with the amount of rain that we've gotten. So some of our tentative and, and pre preliminary results uh, with our short season corn, uh, one of the first things that we've run into is that it's really hard to harvest 104 and 109 day corn separately. Uh, so we are kind of in the back of our mind considering uh, going to a 90 day corn. I really think that would have to be that early to see any difference between a relative maturity. After that uh, harvest, we are planting just a straight cereal rye cover crop at 55 pounds of the acre. Uh, a late September plant date is definitely doable after both 104 and 109 day corn. Uh, so that really hasn't been an issue for, for either relative maturities. Uh, and we, the, the biomass in the fall has been decent. I don't have a picture of that here. Uh, what has really been interesting is our spring biomass. And it's pretty phenomenal, as you can see. This picture was taken, um, I can't get my arrow to work here. Oh, well, uh, there we go. In uh, early, uh, early May of this last planting season, and this was, uh, I see I have it mislabeled. It's not a rye rape fetch mix. It's just a straight up cereal rye mix. So uh, really the um, planting your cereal rye in the fall, if you let that run in the spring, you can get some pretty uh, serious biomass in the spring. Um, as you can see from the uh, corn yield results in 2015, our short season variety yielded 187 and our long 173, uh, which is not really what we were expecting, but there is a caveat there. Our longer season uh, corn started to have some disease problems later in the season. So as we were monitoring our um, moisture in August and they came down about the same and all of a sudden that 170 or that uh, excuse me that 109 day uh, corn just dried down really really fast so it's not really this yield difference is not really uh, fully contributable to the relative maturity alone this last year was really wet in the spring as well as in the fall. I was a little embarrassed to put these yield results up, but there they are. Um, and I, my guess here would be that our, our longer season variety uh, was probably a little more defensive and uh, just had the opportunity to, um, I don't know, battle that, those wet, wet conditions a little more. We had a pretty serious reduction in population early after early in the spring after we planted probably about a 25% reduction in stand. It was a pretty nasty spring planting year last year. 
And this is what it looks like when we're planting soy into 6,000 pounds of biomass. Uh, one of the things that we have found, uh, again, um, we did let our cereal rye run in the spring, meaning we didn't really terminate that until early to mid-May. And when we plant our beans into that, obviously that's going to push back our soy yield. And I'll touch a little bit, or excuse me, soy harvest. And I'll touch on that a little bit uh, more when I talk about our short season soy plot. But I kind of wanted to include these pictures uh, because planting into 6,000 pounds of biomass is was hard. <laughs> uh, we do have GPS, but you can see in the right hand picture, uh, we had, I tried to use my markers just to see if I could do it, and it was difficult. It wrapped around those markers, and uh, I really couldn't even see where we'd been after I turned around. This field did have some problems This uh, where this cereal rye has been knocked down back here. Uh, that wasn't due to the planter. That actually blew down pretty late in the season and we had some trouble uh, this planter really didn't like planting into uh, differing heights of cereal rye it wanted to plant either into all standing cereal rye or all flat cereal rye and as you can see down here this front coulter here this front unit is starting to ride up on some of that cereal rye that's been knocked down so we did have some emergence issues this is in roughly the same spot um, I will say by July, you could barely tell that we had any emergence issues. Uh, however, this did come through in our yield monitor. We had a yield reduction in this area. So this next spring, this coming spring, uh, we're going to, if we have cereal rye that's both standing and knocked down, we're going to set our planter for the depth that it would require to get those beans in the ground for that rye that's been knocked down. And we also got some Keaton seed firmers. I think that may help us get that seed into the right place. So challenges planting into that much biomass. Uh, I will mention briefly, this planter is a relatively new Kinsey with no attachments on it. It's a stock planter. There are no uh, discs, there are no row cleaners, there's no nothing, and, and they're also just rubber closing wheels. So uh, also, as you can see, uh, that much biomass can still hang around. This picture was taken Sunday. One of the benefits we've seen uh, when we plant our cereal rye in the fall, usually our wet spots are a little drier in the fall, so we can actually get something planted into those wet spots. And in the spring, if we can't get a bean crop planted in there, that cereal rye will continue to grow and then uh, fall down to form a mulch mat, as you can see here. Uh, this is not representative of the whole field. This is just representative of um, where beans did not grow very well. So that uh, cereal rye biomass, that mulch mat, didn't compose much at all, which actually turned out to be a good thing. It really helped protect that soil. And you can see, this is my, my buck knife here, you can see it's a pretty thick mulch mat. So we had some benefits that way too. So our short, short season soy, excuse me, short season soy plots haven't been quite as exciting as our short season corn plots. Uh, it's been a frustrating, <laughs> frustrating process to say the least. But we've learned we've learned a lot. One of the first things we've learned is that you can grow Group One Five beans in Iowa and yield pretty well. Um, one of the things, as I mentioned, that we're interested in is planting a legume-heavy mix after soy harvest. Uh, we're shooting for a cereal rye rape vetch mix where the cereal rye is less than 50%. However, you can see from the mix, uh, the green cover seed uh, calculator over here, your hairy vetch mix seed is um, very expensive and it gets your cost per acre up pretty drastically. We're looking at a $50 per acre cost here and that's that's pretty steep, especially not knowing if your vetch is going to make it through the winter. Another thing that we found uh, with uh, plant date, generally common wisdom says that uh, you need to get your legumes in the ground by September 15th in order for it to have any chance of overwintering. And that's, boy, I tell you what, even with a group 1-5 bean, getting your cover crop planted by 9-15 is rather optimistic, uh, especially when your weather has been uncooperative. As you can see from this picture down in the bottom left hand corner, this was taken uh, in November of 2015 after we had planted that mix and the biomass wasn't real <laughs> impressive. And 
when we rolled around to next spring, it didn't look much better. Uh, we, um, a lot of the vetch and rape did not overwinter that year. So we went ahead and terminated that cereal rye pretty early, late March, early April. So by the time we got around to planting corn uh, mid to late April, you could barely tell there was even a cover crop there. And that was sort of frustrating. I took these pictures last Sunday, actually. Uh, the picture on the right is a picture we took with our drone. So you can see the strips here are our actual um, soy short season test plot. And they're green, which is kind of exciting to see in the middle of February. Um, that is our cereal rye rape vetch mix. The mix up here, well, it's not a mix. This is just cereal rye that was planted into corn. Same here. And this is actually the same mix that we planted in our strips over here. So it is it is green and growing out there, which is pretty exciting. Uh, the picture on the top left, you can see a lot of little hairy vetches poking up here, which is exciting also. We'll see if they may get through this upcoming cold snap. Uh, nature can be pretty cruel to have these 70 degree days with some rain and um, have some of the stuff come out of dormancy only to have it hit with 19 degrees here in a couple days. This bottom picture shows what's left of a rapeseed. Uh, they didn't grow too badly in the fall. Uh, it frosts off pretty early. Uh, you can see a little bit of green left in there in the middle. I don't think we're gonna get much out of that this spring, but really when it comes to rapeseed, we don't expect to get much out of it. Um, We'll go back quickly to this um, uh, mix cost here. Uh, two pounds, or excuse me, two dollars per pound for vetch, a dollar for rape, and 21 cents for cereal rye. Shoot, you'd be hard pressed to raise your own cereal rye for that price. So you can see that that hairy vetch really eats into your budget pretty quickly. Our whoops, excuse me, our short season yields have been encouraging. The first year uh, was kind of uh, an experiment uh, for the first time we planted group one beans. Uh, you can see that in 2015 our short season beans yielded 56 and our long yielded 64. Again, another caveat here, um, I really think uh, this had more to do with genetics. When we decided to go with a group one five, I kind of sprung it on our seed dealer in March and if you can believe it, there's no group ones just floating around Iowa. He had to go up to Minnesota to get some, and by then they were pretty slim pickings, and he just kind of took what he could get. And I think our genetics weren't comparable between these two varieties. But there still was a statistically significant yield difference. This year, it was exactly flip-flopped. Uh, we haven't had time to offic get official results uh, with PFI for these short and long season yields. So these are just kind of what I was able to extrapolate using our yield maps. So uh, one of the unexpected um, learning objectives that we that we met was that, again, I'm really not too afraid to be planting early group two and group one soybeans. Now, granted, last year was an outstanding year for soybeans. I think you could have planted just about anything and yielded pretty well. Uh, but I'm really not as gun shy about early season beans as I used to be. One of the caveats with planting an early bean is that in talking to our uh, seed dealer, he mentioned that they see better yields when those shorter seasons are planted later in early to mid-May. And so we've purposely um, kind of delayed our soybean planting to kind of hit that sweet spot. Uh, but of course, this gets into a delayed harvest as well, as I mentioned before. Our neighbor planted a group three bean about a week, well, I would say late April, and we planted our group one five in mid-May, uh, mid and he was harvesting his group threes about a week earlier than we were harvesting our group one fives. So planting date has a pretty uh, profound impact on even beans. Uh, but again, I'm really, um, kind of starting to refocus our attention on spring conditions and letting that cereal rye run to get uh, some benefits out of that cereal rye. Uh, weed suppression is one of the easiest benefits to quantify from a financial standpoint. Um, I will say just from an observation last year in a soybean field that we had, excuse me, in a corn field after harvest, we planted cereal rye and in part of the field we ran out of seeds so we didn't plant anything. 
And when we came back to plant, or excuse me, to, to put on our second application of herbicide, the water hemp that was growing in the part of the field that we had planted cereal rye was only about four inches tall. And the water hemp in the part of the field that we had not planted cereal rye was eight inches and beyond. It was almost getting to the point where we couldn't control it. And this is after we had sprayed uh, our pre on our before we had planted soybeans. So that was after a shot of uh, herbicide already. So I really think that weed control is going to be one of the best places that we can see uh, some uh, financial benefit. So what's next? Well, I think, again, since our attention is starting to focus <clears throat> more on the spring, uh, and I put this picture in on the right here, there was a turtle one morning coming out from the pond. I don't know if he knew where he was going, uh, but I, I, I kind of like this picture because I think changes come slowly, but at least we know where we've been, as you can see from his dewy con trail here, uh, but we might not always know where we're going. But I think in this instance, uh, we are going to really start focusing in on the springtime, especially in uh, soybean fields going into corn. I think we're going to consider planting legumes in the spring before corn, and we are also looking into interseeding legumes into our corn around V5 and V6. Uh, and we've even been considering uh, planting some alfalfa in the spring as well. Uh, 6,000 pounds of biomass seemed relatively easy to achieve. Um, maybe we can achieve 8,000 pounds of biomass. I've learned a lot from reading about no-till organic. Uh, that production system is kind of aiming towards the same same goal we are. Even though we're not organic, we are no-till, but we're looking to use uh, less herbicide, where they're looking to use less tillage, but we're both working towards the same end goal. Uh, of course, uh, part of this system would utilize a roller crimper. Uh, roller crimpers are really interesting and I hope someday that we can get our hands on them. Uh, I'm kind of uh, wanting to see and talk to other people who have used it to get more insight into how to use it and use it effectively. Uh, but I think uh, spring is a very um, interesting and maybe unexplored part of our cover cropping system. And as you can see here, this is another picture taken by uh, our drone. Uh, and you can see some of the green starting to come up here. And in, in mid-February, that's pretty pretty incredible. So I've talked to you about our short season plot design and our uh, tentative results and conclusions and uh, talked about what's next. And so I hope that you found something useful beyond uh, cover cropping 101. Maybe you can consider planting uh, some early maturing corn and soy. Uh, maybe you can let your cereal, cereal rye run in the spring and not be afraid to delay your soy planting and even uh, start investigating really early maturing soybeans and start thinking seriously about spring planted covers too. So as I mentioned, uh, this drone picture that we took on Valentine's Day actually is showing some green growing in February. And while it's not, maybe not quite as green as that uh, first field of cereal rye that we flew over from our trip home from Washington, D.C. in March, we all know that any time we have something green and uh, growing, no matter what time, of we year, what time of year it is, we know in our gut in our, and in our heart of hearts that our soil is happier and healthier. So I hope after today you'll consider managing your cash crop to facilitate your cover crop, not the other way around. And, and do this not just by planting shorter season, uh, shorter season corn and beans, but in any way that you can. Awesome. Th thank you very much, John. That was fantastic. Yeah. Um, we can pause real quick here to see if there's any questions for John before we move on. We don't want you to forget. Uh, if you've got something you wanted to ask John before we move on to Steve, now is the time to get it in the chat box. And you know, John, when when I put your presentation, um, when I uploaded it here, I saw that picture with the turtle and was kind of wondering what you were going to say. <laughs> and, but man, I didn't. What was it? Changes come slowly. At least we know where we've been, though we might not know where we're going. That's awesome. Really well. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, looks like Matt's got a question then about your drill. I think, yeah, go go ahead. Sure, sure. So we have a well-used, probably 90s vintage uh, Great Plains 15-foot drill. And I think there's another question here about earthworms. Have you noticed any? Yeah. Um, 
I haven't actually done any official measurements, uh, and I didn't put a picture in here, uh, but when I was taking pictures uh, Sunday, it's not just earthworms that we're seeing, it's all kinds of predators. Um, there were some um, lady, lady beetles out and active in that cover crop last uh, Sunday, and last spring when I was walking out through that cereal rye when it was five feet tall, it was literally humming with ladybugs. So um, I can't say that, yes, we have definitely seen an increase in soil earthworms. Uh, I can say that we did see an increase in earthworms after we went to no-till. That's definitely um, a yes. Um, but I think uh, we have seen a general increase in soil diversity, whether you want to call them predators or, um, you know, uh, predator-prey interactions, that type of thing. We have definitely seen more species of insects, uh, worms, grubs, you name it. Uh, it's definitely, there's, there's a lot more out there than there used to be. Excellent. There's another question there, John, about the rate of seed in that turtle field. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so that's actually grass. <laughs> I wish it was rye. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. Well, um, yeah, and, and by the way, Stefan, our research scientist here at PFI, has posted some links in there for the, um, for first of all, another project that PFI was involved in, and then it looks like now another one from Iowa Learning Farms that are related to this topic. So, feel free to check those out. Um, looks like the we're good on the questions for John. So I am going to pull up Steve's presentation now, and then we'll hear from Steve McGrew. Thank you, John. Yeah, hi, this is Steve McGrew and uh, from Emerson, Iowa. Our farm is just three miles away from John's and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we've been doing normally for our cover crops at first and then I'm going to go into a few new things we've tried and then as time sees fit, I've got some slides on some of the more basic parts of the cover crops that I wanted to go through and then in the unlikely event, we still have more time left after that, I've got 13 slides on information about our drone and I think maybe that'd be interesting too. And I see Stephanie from Houston, Texas, that's my daughter, so hello Stephanie for coming in. <clears throat> so on our cover crops, the traditional way would be just to put cereal rye in front of both corn and beans. Everybody has their own reason for using cover crops. Ours is more erosion than John's. We're up in the hills, the sea slopes mainly, a few Ds. So we are concerned mostly about erosion. So I want to use those for that. And uh, I worry about putting 100% grass in front of a corn. It's almost like continuous corn. And the Iowa State research shows a small yield drag on corn following a cover crop, which tends to usually be cereal rye. Now, some of the PFI studies don't show quite as much of that, and that's good. But I worry about letting the rye get tall and green the day before you plant corn. So my rule of thumb of don't let it get over six inches that we hear, and 10 days to two weeks before you plant the corn, that's going to be safe. And you'll probably see very little yield drag if you can do that. But if you kill corn, the cereal rye, I mean, when it's two or three inches tall in the middle of April or something, maybe you don't get the benefits that you would have liked to. So those are trade-offs that we keep worrying about. What I like to do a lot would be maybe 25 pounds of cereal rye in the drill following the combine with maybe five pounds of rapeseed. The picture up there also had some hairy vetch in it the year before. So if you chase the combine, every day in the fall is maybe worth a week in the spring. So if you combine your soybeans and have three weeks before a killing frost or whatever, uh, that's just so important to get it on early. So this last year we actually hired somebody to run the drill and chase the combine so we can get it on instead of trying to wait till a day I could do it between harvesting fields or something, so I like that. So if you drilled this field October 11th, and this happened to have the rapeseed and hairy vetch with the rye also, 
that year in this field. Come the middle of March on the top right picture, you've got some cover. And we need the cover coming April and May would be the most important months for erosion on the bean stubble. So that's kind of nice in there. And now on the bottom left, come April 1st, uh, we've got some pretty nice cover. And unfortunately, our 1690 drill has the 15-inch spacing, so it's not quite as nice, but you just go with what you have. We use that to plant soybeans, so we do that. And that's getting up there six, eight inches tall. It's getting about time to kill it there, unfortunately. But, but at least that year, it had good cover. And then in the bottom right picture, you can see we've had a heavy rain there. And it's April 20th, and it's dying down. And it's getting about ready to plant. And I feel pretty good about that for that instance. And then come the end of May, it's all gone. That's kind of disappointing, but that's just the way it is. But that corn will be canoping shortly, and it should be doing all right then. And some years, there's let the rye get bigger. This happens to be wheat here. And it got pretty tall by the time we got the corn planted in it. And I imagine you're going to be seeing a little bit of yield drag with that. Uh, you put up terraces, you're going to lose some bushels too, but uh, I try and keep the cover crops back on the grass, and that's why I'm trying to go more, John mentioned about the broadleaves. If you could do a rapeseed or a hairy vetch or something like that, you're going to get that carbon-nitrogen ratio down and keep your corn from being yellow. We always hear about the allopathy effect, and Tom Casper says he thinks it's more than that. It's more the physical, the shade, the nutrient uptake, and and lack of warm soil or something like that, I believe. So whatever the reason is, I just want to keep that to more minimum. And on the soybeans, if you kill the rye early in the season when you plant too, you kind of wonder how much money's worth you got on that. This happens to be the wheat in this field, aerial seeded the fall before, but if you kill this today, uh, I'm not sure how much good you got out of that. So it's almost becoming mainstream now to let the cereal grains grow up to the day of planting. You saw John's drill in his too. May 19th, this field in the upper left is actually a fairly erosive field. And that cover there is just really nice. I feel really good about that cover there. So you just run the drill out in it. I think I would rather terminate it ahead of the planter just to spray the cereal rye a little better. If you follow the drill, there might be some stuff knocked down that you might not get a good contact with the spray and it could come up. And the funny thing is you can kill small rye and when it's bolting, it's kind of hard to kill like a lot of weeds, but then once it starts heading out, like in these pictures, it's then actually easier to kill. We started backing down a roundup. I think I was over 32 ounces for a while, and it was just dying so easy that I backed down. And we go ahead and put our normal herbicide spray in that, the authority. And if you have the 2,4-D, you better pay attention to the labels and keep it ahead of the planting a little more yet. But um, you can do that. And in the bottom left in June, you still got a whale of a cover, and you can see the beans are coming up, and they don't care. The beans don't mind that rye. Now, I never would have done this with corn, but when you put that rye in ahead of the beans, and uh, I try and get yield tests, and it's always hard to do, but I generally see maybe one bushel more of beans in the rye than without, and that's hardly statistical, but... It just seems to be a pretty common theme with us. And so just think of the cover you get over there on the left, even in June, and the organic matter you're adding, and the weed suppression. There aren't annual, there aren't winter annuals in that. And I imagine it's, oh, I've seen studies that even helps with your water hemp control a little bit, even though they come up much later. So I kind of like doing that, really. And where the corn, um, you know, you struggle to break even with that on uh, grass in front of the corn. And then come a little later in June, that's going away, but that's okay. Those beans will be canopied pretty soon. And then the bottom picture on the right, they've canopied over and you didn't even know that there was a cover crop out there. And where the airplane ran out of seed, uh, there's quite a stark difference in cover on the fields. 
on the bottom right picture, let's look in the other direction a month later, and the beans are doing very well on that dead rye. And we don't do a heavy seeding of rye. Uh, we're doing maybe by air 30 or 35 pounds, and by the drill maybe uh, 20 to 25 pounds with some broadleafs in it too. We tend not to put broadleafs in by air because the broadleaf struggles more on top of the ground broadcast. And we're doing less and less broadcast for the 15 to 17 dollar cost. Um, I just don't know. It's it's higher risk. Uh, it can work on the cereal grasses like the cereal rye and wheat or something like that. And but you're gonna have incomplete coverage, and um, you will get a month more of growth, and that's the great thing. Some agencies are thinking that's the way to go because that month in the fall is tremendous more growth, and then it's just done. They think farmers will get it done that way, and next spring it looks similar, but they've taken a backhoe out there and dug pits, and you have considerably more roots in the September planted by air than you do the October planted by a drill. So even though it looks the same, there is big differences, but we don't do as much by air. Maybe we drill all we can and do a little bit by air just to put some rye in the maybe the corn stalks or something that'll be going to beans because we can let that grow and 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 that would be great. I see you thoughts about the cereal rye in a winter annual legume? Yes, and I will be talking about that. So by putting the broad leaves in with the cereal rye, that will reduce that carbon nitrogen ratio and it is an average. So if you get that in there and get the ratio closer to what the corn wants, um, you would have very little effect on at least the nitrogen tie up in that. So that's why we do try and balance that out. And the rapeseed is inexpensive, a dollar a pound, and you get a couple hundred thousand seeds. And that's why I push that so hard. And the five pounds is a heavy rate. Three pounds would be maybe more of a normal rate. But uh, so five pounds of rapeseed, and if it grows, um, that would be great. The picture before, we seeded that or a couple before October 11th, and our rapeseed did not overwinter. And John, who's just three miles west, his did overwinter a week or two earlier than ours. And I wonder if that has to do with the planting date, maybe. Um, there's a question about soybean development. <clears throat> I don't see any difference in the emergence of the soybeans. You would think so because there might be a little less light, but by the time it's emerging there's not much, so no. The beans seem just fine. I feel very comfortable putting the beans and, and again we're at 30 pounds by air or 25 by the drill, so we don't have quite as thick a cover as John has and, and maybe that's just the way I would like it maybe. They ask what the benefits of the rape is. That would be we talked about uh, getting that carbon nitrogen ratio down a little bit if it's going to be corn in front of it. And I probably wouldn't bother spending the money if it's going to soybeans because the cereal rye is fairly inexpensive and the beans seem very happy in that. And so I'm just glad to leave that alone there. We have a question of frost seeding, rape seed and rye. I've wondered about that. But if you're going to be seeding the rye or the winter wheat anyway, then you'd about want to make it one trip. And uh, we will be doing a PFI test here in uh, March, maybe, about frost seedings on broadcast, some of these mustards and rape seeds. So we'll find out. Um, that would be OK. And we use the, the dwarf Essex rape. I forget if that's called. A, I'm guessing that's an oil seed rape, but I'm not real sure. It's We terminate it before it gets very big, so I don't think it be very much there. We have a question on cool season cover crops, weeds. Yes, uh, definitely the the tall cereal rye will shade out, especially the winter annuals, and even helping some of the water hemp and things like that the next year. There's definitely uh, less weed pressure in the bottom of that right picture where there's the cover than where there's the bare dirt. Now, unfortunately, when you spray herbicide on that live rye, it does metabolize some of the herbicide. And we saw 
where he had like a hairy veg that metabolized it and then it got fairly weedy later on. But the cover offsets the metabolizing the herbicide, so it's still actually cleaner. And uh, while I'm thinking about it, um, I think um, that maybe, um, well, I forgot what I was going to say on that. But anyway, um, we'll be doing that later then. And I see we have a comment that dwar dwarf Essex is a 4-H type. So we also did spring seeded cover crops for the last two years. And I don't know if it's any better than the fall seeded cereal rye, probably not, but maybe you didn't get it seeded last fall or you just had a little more time and you wanted to do it. And so this is going to corn. So I didn't want a lot of grass in front of it again. So instead of a bushel of oats, I just did 10 pounds and five pounds of rapeseed and two pounds of mustard. And of course I didn't get the drill calibrated. So it went on heavier than that. But um, Usually you have a day or two in March that you can seed oats with. And if you miss that, you're going to have to wait till April. So you got to be ready. So it was a cooler spring. And so the oats and that didn't grow as much as I would have liked. The middle of April, you can kind of see it. You see on the bottom screen, there's a lot of that rape seed up there. That's going good. And I didn't want a lot of oats coming up anyway. So that's okay. And now by the end of April, it's starting to come on a lot better, but it's getting time to plant corn. And so we'll go ahead and terminate that in a few days. And we anhydrist it. And uh, we have a, a different kind of anhydrous bar with the rubber roller track, so it didn't dig it up as normal. And uh, May 1st, you've got maybe 8-inch growth and a lot of rapeseed, mustard, and oats. So this year it did work out okay, or that year. Um, it grew up, and, and oats have some benefits to the soil that cereal rye doesn't have. And uh, so the oats are kind of nice or inexpensive, and, and it wasn't a bad thing to do that year. We, you terminate it, and it leaves quickly, but... Uh, it did do some protection in the spring there a little bit. Plant corn in it, terminate it, and it's starting to die down. And on purpose, I did an experiment. So we did like a harness, which has like a harness is similar to lasso and an atrazine mix and a 2,4-D. So on purpose, I did not put Roundup in it. I wanted to see since oats are sensitive when they emerge with atrazine, I wanted to see what would happen if I just did just the atrazine harness mix. And it uh, did not kill about 10% of the oats. I was kind of surprised. I thought a pound of atrazine on that would easily kill them, but it didn't. And, you know, 8-inch oats, I would have thought, shouldn't have been that hard to kill. But on the bottom picture, we come through with the Roundup Callisto mix so for our planned post-spray in June. So well, or late May, so it got them pretty easy there. But um, So I guess next time it wouldn't hurt to put a few dollars of Roundup in that. And then this spring we did just pure oats before soybeans. I thought that would be a quick uh, crop to get up, and since the beans would be planted later, it would uh, have more time to grow than in the corn, and, and I don't mind the beans growing up in the oats either. And as they're coming up, uh, May 8th, you can see it didn't suppress the winter annuals as well. You can see some of those growing there. I would have thought maybe they would have a little more than that, but cereal rye would have been more complete, And but the oats um, did a little bit there. I'll talk about relay cropping. So relay cropping is, by definition, seeding two different crops at two different times. And then we go ahead and combine them at two different times. So this was a field earlier that had the 30 pounds of aerial cereal rye on it back in September. And that's not enough to combine, but this idea just came up kind of at the last minute. So as we were drilling the cereal rye, I mean, as we were drilling the soybeans in this field, I did not spray three acres of this just to see what would happen when you combine it. And a drill is maybe not the best choice to be relay cropping because the 15-inch spacings are going to pack 
more of the rye down than a 30 inch planter would. And so um, that was one thing against it maybe. And when we uh, go ahead and run the drill in it, it did knock down quite a bit. And the theory is the earlier you plant your soybeans, the less it'll damage the cereal rye, but the more the, when you combine the rye in July will damage your beans because the beans will grow tall on this. And when you combine the cereal rye, the combine will cut the tops off of the beans. So this happens to be a different field, but it would have been the same thing. We sprayed most of the field with the Authority XL, which has Classic in it, and the Roundup and the 2,4-D. But on that plot there, we probably could have used Authority on that, but the Zidju is labeled, and it's similar to a, a Lasso Dual, kind of a small seeded product. Because other years we've tried this, we can get weeds in that especially foxtails. So we put the Zidju in that and there was rust in the cereal rye. So we went ahead and put some headline in that. Oh, it's getting kind of late in the year. I would have rather have done this when the cereal rye was a foot tall, but we had a wet year and this was the last field we planted. So it just got kind of late. And then we put some, a little bit of 2,4-D in there too to get any winter annuals that were in there. And we put 30 pounds of nitrogen, some liquid in there uh, to help the cereal rye out, although it's getting so mature at that point, I'm not sure how much it did. So on the right is the normal beans that were planted, uh, and the rye killed with Roundup, and on the left had the Zidua treatment in there, and um, it's going well, except uh, you look in there, we probably had a half a stand by air, and after the drill went over it, we probably had about a fourth of a stand left. And plus, it wasn't a very good year for cereal grains, as the year before wasn't either. So you go out there, and there's just not a lot of grain in the heads, and other people growing it for combining didn't get a good yield. I'm afraid Iowa, maybe in our southwest Iowa, uh, just it's going to be tough sometimes. We get too much rain, and, and it just doesn't always work. And July 8th now, it's starting to get dry, and the beans aren't as tall on the right in there as they would be a lot of years just because they were planted so close to when the cereal rye was mature. And if you would have planted beans the 1st of May and the cereal rye a foot tall, you would have had pretty tall beans, and you'd combine and be cutting the tops of those off then. There's a question about... Uh, the relay cropping weed problems. Yeah, it can be hard getting a herbicide to get the weeds out. Some organic people just do this, plant rye and the beans and then have no herbicides. And that actually be a pretty good way. So it, it does help suppress the weeds, but in our system, we try and find a herbicide that'll get that out. The year before when we did it with without a small seeded broadleaf or foxtail, uh, we had a lot of foxtail in the beans that, that came up and then we sprayed them later with a roundup but to kill the foxtail but but still it would do that i'm not sure about the winter flooding or extreme cold um, i guess if the winter or floods get your cereal rye um, then you're out of luck and now the rye is getting dry and it's about ready to combine this was the year before, it was the only picture I had of it getting combined, and you see it's cutting a little of the tops of the beans off, and, and the year before, uh, there was absolutely no rye in there, and the neighbors uh, also, it was a pretty tough year, and, and I think we got about a bushel an acre when we went around the hill, so we just didn't even bother to combine the rest of it, it and that wasn't the fault of the relay cropping, it was just the, the year, a bad year for cereal rye, as was this year too, and I don't know what you do about that. That might be the biggest reason I might not do much more of this because um, it's just um, maybe not a good crop for us to be harvesting in southwest Iowa consistently. So the combine went over this, and uh, you can see it took some of the tops of the beans off, but it it got it. And my biggest disappointment is the combine wheels, wheels killed the soybeans there. I thought maybe they could take that, but they were big enough that it killed it. So now all of a sudden we're uh, getting hurt on our on our soybean yield too. 
So you can see the normal beans on the right and the relay cropping beans on the left. And in September, the end of September, they're looking kind of peaked. I'm not sure why. If it was just uh, being under that cereal rye there a little bit. And, and you can see the wheel tracks because it's a, just a 15-foot head on that wider combine for this. And uh, so the tire tracks are coming along there quite a bit, you know. So I'm trying to get my point there. We go. So that was from the past, and coming back the other way, you get that one there, and and these two. So it did run over quite a bit, really. I was kind of a little disappointed in that. And so going back to the other slide, we got seven bushels an acre of rye, which is uh, not very good yield for a cereal rye at all. And that was more just because of the low population this year, I think. It. Um, we just had a half a stand, and then the drill took the other half out of it, and, and that's just the way it was. And this corner of the field wasn't as high yielding as the rest, so we got 31 bushel of beans on the relay beans, and then 48 bushel of beans on the normal. And um, the rest of the field was a little more than that. And then this was a picture where the airplane ran out of of uh, cereal rye seed and the beans were yielding about one bushel over five replications in the cover crop than without so I feel that the letting the cover crop go clear up to the day of planting soybeans does not hurt the bean yields they just seem to do that and the question yes we do have the same population the drill just went across the beans and into the other relay crop and he didn't even know which I was going to leave so he just went back and forth and we plant a low population of about 130,000 beans because uh, all tests show that a population over 100,000 has maximum yields but that's fairly low with that. The question about timing is everything that is for sure on the relay cropping and labor management uh, yeah you probably got to be there if I had to do it again, I probably would have planted these when the rye was a foot tall, and then it might have hurt the beans more yet, and when the combine ran over the bigger beans, uh, it probably would have uh, smashed more yet. And this is just kind of interesting. I have a few odd pictures here. So when the airplane did some cereal rye seed in the standing corn, um, the next spring, it's interesting where he accidentally got on the be soybean stub on the right. The cereal rye is greener and doing better. I don't know if it's because it's more nitrogen or maybe the atrazine carryover on the left is hurting it a little bit. I wonder why. I always see that though. And here's Stefan's hand seeded cover crop plot. And uh, we don't have very good luck with the broadcast seeded in uh, oh this was even in August uh, the beans hadn't even yellowed yet when their deadlines are for seeding that and I think that's some of the problem the lights not down there yet I'd like to wait until they were yellowing but maybe more yet is our herbicide program our authorities have the classic in it and our we've even tried the authority elite that has dual instead of classic and that was this field and it still did the same thing too so I don't know. It, it could be a herbicide. Uh, I'd ask uh, Dr. Bob Hartzler about, since I worried about the carryover, but since the drill to the right was fine a month later, and the broadcast that was on top, which should have been maybe less herbicide in the very top, I would think that should be less problems. But he said, but your roots are so compromised on the seed on top of the ground, it would be believable that the healthier plant being drilled could stand the herbicide carryover any better. And uh, yeah, and um, the Iowa Soybean Association did some aerial strips of the triticale clover radish across the field, and I put this in there just to show uh, what it did to the winter annuals. This field we got to later, we would have liked to have sprayed it with herbicide to get rid of the winter annuals. And, uh, but you can just see quite a difference in that between uh, 
where the plain strips are and there's not the winter annuals and in the rest of the field there is. And then Steve, I've got as much time as you want on my basic pictures here. Do you want me to go through a little more of these or are we about enough on well, time wise now? Yeah, well you've uh, done a great job answering questions as they come along so maybe you can take a, a few more minutes and, and do these basic slides and then we will uh, see if there's any more questions for you and for John because uh, we got until about 8.30 so um, you've already answered quite a few questions so I'd say um, we can let you keep going for a little bit. Okay, I'll just go through these a bit. So I talk about erosions our main concern for cover crops. I bet you John would tell you he's worried about the soil health and uh, maybe compaction and drainage, but ours is erosion. And uh, April 22nd, a five inch rain was hard on the field. And so you can see up above there where we had the, this happened to be wheat that year. Uh, we used wheat in the past hoping it would uh, be less antagonistic to corn and uh, and Tom Casper says that it depends on the variety some wheat can be worse than cereal rye and the wheat is much easier to establish and more aggressive so we've gone back to that but where the wheat was above there no ditches and to the line where I ran out there's ditches so boy a couple more bushels of wheat would have really helped that poor field out. Uh, we've been taking the Haney tests for the NRCS over a five year period. And um, the soil health calculation, the first yellow line, is uh, a lot of what we're looking for. They'd like to see you have at least seven. And the horse pasture with the manure was 21. And uh, maybe that's what you would expect. And then the next year, all these numbers were relative and they were almost twice as high or something. But they come up there. So the long term no till was 5.8. That's not quite high enough. And where we had the triticaline rape, even though it was only three inches at the time we sampled, it was a 7.2. So we got our seven soil health calculation. And then 10 miles south on kind of a poor field, uh, we had some 10 inch wheat there and we were 5.8. So at least that matched up to the a different spot where the the soil was better at the 5.8. So maybe the cover crop brought that up a little bit. That Savito test on the right, that's it's interesting. They dry the soil down and add water to it, and then measure how much the organisms are breathing, and they catch the CO2, and that goes into part of this calculation. Way back, we had maybe almost $30 of cereal rye on the left compared to $5 a wheat on the right or something and you're thinking well I don't know if that's worth $30 on the right and probably most years it isn't but I really like Harry Vetch it's just hard to justify the expense of that maybe and so um, that year the two pictures on the left we had 18 inches of Harry Vetch and that was well worth the $30 then and on the right this was some aerial hairy vetch a different year that we just had a little scattering of some of it and that uh, we did not get our money's worth out of that and I'm really reluctant to put broadleafs on by air it just it's high risk but um, I hate to rely if we get a mix in with the drill at least you kind of do your spread out your risk a little bit and on the bottom that wheat there it was nice and tall and we got our money's worth we did terminate the wheat sooner than we did the hairy vetch because we we didn't mind planting corn right into the hairy vetch pretty quick and it didn't plug the planter surprisingly but the wheat like cereal rye I want to keep it 10 or 14 days back from the planter don't let it get even this tall here like it is and and that's some cereal rye over on the right a different year and and that was a cooler spring and by the time you terminated I just don't really know if you got your money's worth and here is the check plot with and without hairy vetch and the corn on a replication was eight to ten bushels higher in the hairy vetch I, I should have said hairy vetch before on the left than the check and you might expect that because of the more nitrogen and the more mellow soil so the corn really likes that John talked about the alfalfa in the spring. That'd be an interesting experiment. I don't know how big that could get. 
I threw this in here because we did some CSP seeding on the head lens way back and planted in April until October it's up to your chest about but with our cover crops after beans that's kind of tough to do. A, a corn soybean rotation is a challenging rotation to get a cover crop and if you were combining wheat in July or silage in September there's a lot of things you can do and when we do the corn and soybean rotation with full season maturities it gets challenging. I'm interested to see John's experiment with a shorter season. We're not willing to do that yet. I'm concerned about the yields, but he's shown some promise on that. So, and of course, it would just depend on the, <clears throat> excuse me, on the year. Uh, we had a sprayer boom malfunction on killing some cereal rye once, and so uh, 13 days later, I came back and resprayed the field to kill that. And uh, you can see that poor corn. And so on the bottom picture, 13 days after it was even sprayed, so 26 days after the first was sprayed, that corn is hurting. And I couldn't get a yield monitor because there wasn't enough rows in there. But uh, you know that's going to hurt your corn. So I would never do that with corn on purpose. And the beans don't care. We've talked about the aerial versus the drill. Um, we're doing less and less aerial. It sure is easy. It can be done. and and then you don't have to worry about it, but um, it it just the drill is more reliable. It's just that you lose a month's growth. We did an experiment PFI back 2010 where they aerial sprayed strips of the it was radish and rapeseed and hairy vetch on the beans going to corn the next year. And then we came in with the GPS modern and drilled in between those strips and also left a check. And it'd be kind of like you'd think. On the bottom left, the air had much bigger plants, but only maybe a 10% stand. So we've got big radish and rapeseed and some hairy vetch, but uh, not, not as thick as the drill on the right. This picture here that was a test that had some oats in it, and this test did not have the oats in it. And you see the big radish that was um, aerial seed in September on the left. And then you see the here, and then you see the little ones that were drilled in October, and the same with the rape seed here and here. So it's kind of like you think you get bigger plants, but less of a stand. And, and we all know we should probably aerial seed 50% more by air than the drill, but nobody wants to spend the money. John and I went out once into his triticale patch. It was 18 inches tall. We always hear about cover crops taking moisture. And so we went out there and we took different depths, 2 and 6 and 12 and 24 inches. And it's just like you would think. That day, the 2-foot sample was drier than where there was no cover crop. But look at the temperature and the bare dirt on a different part. You had 94 degrees, and in this cover you had 88. And then in the shade of the triticale that wasn't even uh, knocked down for planting, he was going to combine it. It's down to 73. So we hear that there comes a point in August where this cover and lower temperatures, you will actually have moisture, more moisture in the cover crop someday in the year. And the top two inches back in whenever this was June we did that was actually wetter in the cover surprisingly but the two foot was drier but eventually come August when you need the moisture with that cooler temperature um, there will be some point where the there will be more in there. We have a question on drones. I wish we had time. I've got 13 pictures on the drones but yes I think Drones can be okay. We're going to get more use out of our drone than I thought, I think. We can get the near-infrared, the NDVI pictures out of it. You can see where your cover crop's growing better. You can see where your corn's getting shorter in nitrogen and for maybe a $1,300 investment with everything. And if you fly enough acres, some guys are flying their acres three to five times. Uh, I do like the sound of that. I think we'll get quite a bit of use out of that. One April, I took the fertilizer cart and did some ditches with cereal rye. And when I came with the herbicide in May, I didn't have the heart to kill it. So I just left the ditch. It was 20 feet wide. 
and coming back in June with a post spray on the corn, just look what that rye did to that poor corn in that ditch there. But that's okay. It was just a small ditch. But uh, that corn struggled, and it wouldn't do that. And I don't have enough time to explain this picture here. But uh, anyway, Steve? Yeah, great. Thank you very much, Steve. That was a ton of really useful uh, information. So we do have time for questions here. Um, John, you're still there, right? And and feel free to start things off here, John, if you've got any questions or comments about Steve's presentation. Otherwise, if anybody in there wants to type something in the chat box, we've got both these guys ready to answer your questions. I see there's a question here about would you call cereal rye a nutrient catch crop for nitrogen and potassium? I'm sure it would be everything. Uh, if you let it go too late, your ratios get so high, you might not get the nitrogen until later in August or something, and then you might have yellow corn before that. But yes, any cover crop would be called a, a catch crop. The, uh, the, there was a question about what kind of clover in that uh, ISA plot. It, was something, it began with a B, Bantium, or something like that. I'd never heard of it before. I don't think we saw a lot of that. I wish red clover could be used more. I've tried it a lot and never had much luck with red clover, and I don't know why. Another thought I also thought about, some guys with the mixtures get really creative, and they'll go out with a select corn spray, like select or something, and kill out the cereal rye, and then let the legumes keep growing until the day of planting. But it'd be another trip with a sprayer, but that'd be interesting too. And John, do you have some comments? I was just going to add to that uh, uh, cereal rye being a nitrogen scavenger. Uh, certainly the Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy bears that out in their um, suggestions for how we can reduce our nutrient load in our waterways. Uh, cover crops are right up there at the top to uh, help mitigate that problem. Yeah, I, I agree. No, it wasn't bursine clover. It was something a little weirder than that. B-A-N something. So I'm not, I guess I hadn't really heard of it before. Yeah, that's it, Margaret. It looks like uh, Neil's got a question there for Steve about how did you adjust the timing of your nitrogen application in corn? Did you cover that yet? No, I haven't. So where is this at? Oh, okay. Well, we just use, we split our nitrogen into three sources. So we VRT on our, our map, our phosphate fertilizer. So there's some nitrogen in that. So we get zero to 30 pounds of nitrogen on with our dry fertilizer in whenever, February or March. And then we do spring anhydrous usually. And we have that Ag Synergy bar so it doesn't tear up the soil or the cover crops either. It has snowmobile roller tracks that go beside the knife and hold it down. So we just do it in the spring. And then when we spray our herbicide on, we put five gallons of UAN in that for another source. And it's a great surfactant. That's 18 pounds. And we just go the Iowa State rate of the last year, I think it was 140 for our economics. and. And then every field, I put a check strip of 250 pounds on as, a, as we're VRT and the nitrogen on anyway, just to get a yield comparison with a half an acre around that half an acre. And uh, this, this year was the first, this last year was the first year we saw a significant difference on the 250 versus the 140 because we apparently lost a lot of nitrogen, even on spring anhydrous. We have a question of why I'd like to use clover. Um, east of us in Indiana and that, they use a lot of clovers for cover crop and it's inexpensive. It'd be a good legume. If we plant alfalfa, it's going to be fairly expensive. And I've tried it in the fall and the spring and I don't know why I haven't had very good luck, but maybe I need to keep trying. But it's just a nice cheap legume cover crop. I'm still hunting for that perfect broadleaf cover crop in front of the corn. We've got the soybeans covered pretty well with the cereal rye going late, but the corn I'm struggling to get 
something to hold down the erosion in the soybean stubble and uh, also help the yield because I think a broadleaf, especially a legume, will increase our corn yields. I, I, yes, I would definitely put the clover before the corn. I don't even know, I don't think I'd put any broadleafs in front of the soybeans, although we have to for some of our government equip programs because they require that mix. But uh, on our normal ones, uh, I just want grass in front of beans and broadleafs in front of corn as much as possible, or a mix at least to get the CN ratio a little better. I would add on the on a clover, one of the things that we're exploring is planting clover with uh, an oat crop in the spring, harvesting off that oat crop to, to save the seed in July and letting that clover go for the rest of the year, uh, at which point it would probably overwinter just fine, uh, and, and then we can plant corn to that the following year. That, that would be great. And and one thing I forgot to mention on a relay crop that, uh, you know, it didn't pencil out with the seven bushels of cereal rye and the three-fourths of a yield of beans. But if a guy needed some cereal rye seed, you know, that's maybe okay on a few acres. And in this case, we didn't get enough, so it didn't be worth it. But I guess you could have just went ahead and terminated it when you saw that things weren't going well. We have frost seeding, clover, and rye. Um, that'd be interesting. Maybe, maybe Stefan, if we do our frost seeding of the rape seeds and musters, I should throw out some red clover too and see what happens. And I think that's the cut type of thing we're looking at too, to, to kind of get our minds beyond just planting uh, mono culture of. of cover crops in the fall. It, it would be interesting to plant 30 pounds of cereal rye in the fall after soybean harvest and then in the spring go ahead and frost seed in some clover or some other kind of legume and see if we couldn't get our legume population up that way. Well there you go and if you couldn't get into there because of rain at least you had something. That's interesting, Margaret's red clover, the high rate, and uh, that's interesting. Yeah, and Tom, if, about your question about terminating that clover, we would terminate it with an herbicide, more than likely. Ideally, it'd be nice to, to graze it first, but... And that is a comment. John's grazing. If you've got livestock, that really helps out justifying the cover crops. That's great if that happens to work out. And these last two years have been outstanding years for any kind of cover crop. Long fall, mild winter, early spring. Are you guessing, Steve, we're going to wait till later to show the drone pictures? Well, I was going to kind of gauge the chat box here uh, and see if, I mean, if we keep rolling with questions, we just finish out our time with this. Um, so I, maybe we'll do a last call right here. If you've got some more questions, get them in the chat box. Otherwise, um, Steve's got a few slides here on uh, him using his drone. And so... Um, if I don't see any questions in here, we can let you go right into that, Steve. And John, go ahead if you've got something else to say too before that. Nope, nope. I think that about covers it. And John, you well, why is... John, you had mentioned that you used a drone too, is that right? Yeah, yeah, we got ours about the same time as Steven did, but crashed ours immediately. So we just oh. got it back from the repair shop about a month ago. So we're a little behind the curve. <laughs> <laughs> but it is we can see a lot of benefits for it it's uh, it's kind of an exciting technology and it's it's uh, exciting that it's um, the cost has come down to the point where uh, you know your regular user can can get some pretty good use out of it yeah cool cool well um, yeah I'll say one plug real quick here if you're still tuned in I did put up that box to take a survey to give us some feedback so before you sign out for the night um, please it just give us a couple minutes it takes to give us some feedback um, and thanks for tuning in but yeah we've got 10 minutes here Steve if you want to if you want to go right into this thanks 
Okay, so we got the Phantom 4 drone, and I'm using it more than I thought I would, and I've seen more benefit than I thought I would out of this. And of course, 10 months after they came out with it, now there's the new 4 Pro, but just like a computer, that's just what happens, but that's okay. So they're running, I think now even the Pro you could almost get for the $1,200 plus. You about need two more batteries because... Uh, the 20 some minutes on a battery is just barely enough and then you can't even charge it until it cools down so you about need to be flying one and cooling one down and charging the other and uh, the f biggest difference on the Phantom Pro is it has a better camera full inch lens and it has sensors also on the back and the sides like this one you cannot fly into your house it'll stop it but uh, you can back into it unlike that and so if you buy extra software, I'll talk about that later. The 4K camera, even on this Phantom 4, is just amazing. I just sit with my mouth open in front of the screen seeing these pictures. And um, this little picture here maybe doesn't do it justice, but um, they're just really great. And I took it up the first time and looked at the video, and I thought, well, this isn't a video. It's a still picture. And then all of a sudden I saw the cars going by on the road. And I'm just surprised it could be that stable. I would think it'd be shaking and vibrating. So the pictures are just fantastic. The resolution at 400 foot, which is its maximum legal height, is two inches. And 20, supposedly 28 minute battery, it's usually a little less than that. And the battery, you can do about 80 acres in 20 minutes with it. So it's really quite a bit. Uh, just some interesting things. Uh, you're supposed to fly it within line of sight of the drone, and uh, that's pretty hard to see that white drone up there. You go 400 foot above the ground or above a building. You need to register your drone and pay the FAA $5 if it's between 0.55 pounds and 55 pounds, which these are. You would need a UAV license if you use it for commercial business. And one example of a commercial business is a farmer using it to check his irrigation pipes. So I assume that would include us too. So I think I'm going to try and take my test, but it's really not geared for a farm. It's geared for avoiding airports and the cities and things like that. And so that seems a little silly, but I'll probably do it. You're prohibited from flying over uncovered people or animals. You must yield to all other aircraft, even on your own field. If the neighbors turn a spray crop playing around in your field, you've got to go down and give him way. Only Class G airspace, which would be most of the stuff above our farm without a waiver, cannot fly within five miles of an airport. Fly during daylight hours. If you don't have special lights on, you could then get another 30 minutes before or after sunset. You have to report over $500 of de property damage, not including your drone. So if you smash out the guy's windshield in the car and it costs over that, you have to do that. Can't go over 100 miles an hour. Ours cruises at 23 miles an hour, and you can put in sport mode, maybe go up to 45 miles an hour. That's, but it takes a lot more battery that way. And uh, the program that comes with the DJI Phantom 4 is the Go app, and that's the free app with it, and that's nice, but there's a $25 Litchi app that I like a little better. You can set waypoints to make it fly automatically, and so you could tell it to go to this corner of the field and start and turn on the camera here and take a picture there, turn on video over there and turn it on and turn around. When I'm in the daylight, it's hard to see with the sunshine on the tablet, and so if I can just do it automatically, that's a lot nicer. And a picture down here, that two inch resolution, you can zoom in and and really take a good look at it. You might not know where you're at. And it's just as well as video didn't transfer. We probably would have locked up everybody's computers. So the program called Drone Deploy, you can stitch together the pictures. So you fly a 80 acre field, you're gonna get four or five hundred pictures at four or five meg each. So you have just several gigabytes, a tremendous amount of pictures and the drone deploy you can it'll just automatically fly back and forth you tell it what height and what percent overlap of the pictures and it'll just do it and when the battery gets low it'll come back and you trade batteries and it'll go back up and take off where it left off that part's free but then to stitch them together is so much a month I'm not sure how much that is or a thousand dollars a year and if you have enough acres and do them enough times if you did your acres three or five times and had enough acres I think that would be all right.
get some good out of that. And uh, this is a drone deploy field. That black in the upper left there, I'm assuming that's smaller than one of the 400 pictures would be. I guess I didn't do the math, but uh, it's a lot of pictures. So you zoom in uh, two inches on the left there. You can see the planter shutoffs, and and that's kind of neat to you know see that maybe your on and off isn't too bad and then you zoom in a little more you can about see every corn plant and and you can even there's a a company out there that'll uh, let you uh, do the statistical spacing and population analysis and they have a I guess a free trial on one field that'd be interesting to do that and so then the drone deploy the picture on the left is the normal red green blue picture we would get and um, on the right is their near infrared the NDVI and you can kind of see some of the the tile lines in the spring before there and you can see the grass waterway there and the tile there and and this was we got it later in the year so next year if we can go out in the earlier part of the year we'll see a lot more I'm colorblind can you guys help me is that green or red there but the red is the worst photosynthesis and the greens better and I can do elevation maps so these are the same fields again and it'll do 3d modeling so you can fly over there and see your 3d grain bands it looks a little funny it looks like they're melted when you zoom in but there are ways you can fly different elevations and get that better I need to try that we had about 50,000 bushel of grain pile there, and, and it'll figure the volume of a pile. It said about 53,000, and we didn't get a good uh, measurement to see what that was because we were blending it in with some drier corn in the bin, but uh, it, it apparently was pretty close. It's kind of interesting. And that's following the combine with the drill right beside that tile line I was talking about. So did we get done in time, Steve? Yeah, yeah, that was a really great way to wrap up the last few minutes that we had here. Uh, thanks for preparing that, Steve. So, yeah, maybe. Great. And, we, and we talked about uh, we ought to do one of these sometime on the drones. I think there'd be some interest in that. Yeah, exactly. And if the, so, another plug here for me to take, if you take that survey, we, that's what we're looking for is for feedback on what topics you want to hear about in the future. So, that means, you know, topics. This is for farminars, but you know we take this list also and see if it applies to field days. So right now we're planning our field days. So if you want to hear about drones or anything else for our upcoming field day season or a future farminar, give us that feedback and we know who to ask to talk about it. But uh, thank you very much, Steve, and thank you very much, John, for preparing these presentations and taking the time to share all your knowledge with us tonight. And um, I appreciate everybody tuning in and, and asking great questions. This was a really great farminar. Thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. Thank you.